Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Under the Macroscope, our weekly catch-up with Skybound Capital's Chief Strategist in the UK office, Jabir Sadawala. Uh, during the course of this podcast, we're going to be talking about, amongst other things, uh, job numbers out in the US and uh, the consequences of the currency, the US dollar. A bit of a standoff between France and England around uh, fishing rights. And uh, we're also going to be talking about some local council elections and uh, the meaning of those for the Conservative Party, the Labour and uh, some of the smaller political parties in the UK. More of that later. But first, welcome to Jabir, as I can call him today, because he's had his second jab. And let's just start there. We've spoken a lot about vaccines on this podcast. You've had the personal experience uh, today of your, your second jab. How are you feeling? Yeah, no, it's uh, um, so far in keeping with the first one. And um, it's a relief, to be honest. It's an absolute relief. You know, just the, I think it's just the, the joy of knowing it's out of the way. Um, the process was as efficient as ever. Um, I joined the queue. It was a long queue and I thought I'm going to be here for hours, but I wasn't. It was it felt like in and out. Um, and uh, I think it's just testament, really, to the way the whole vaccination program is, seems to be going in the UK. Um, but yeah, the main, the main feeling is one of relief. Yeah. And, uh, Good. Well, hopefully, you'll, hopefully your mind is as sharp as the needle. Uh, <laughs> so let's get on to some interesting numbers out of the US, Jabir. Job yeah. numbers, not as good as expected, and an immediate effect on the US dollar. That's right, yeah. I have to admit, when I first saw the release, um, I was quite shocked. I thought, you know, something's gone badly wrong here. Um, so market in general was expecting job gains uh, of close to a million. Um, so was I, frankly. Um, and that's what we had roughly the month before. But then when you look at the detail, the month before was revised down quite sharply um, by over 140 or thousand, um, but still a respectable figure. Um, so this month, to suddenly hear that only 266,000 jobs have been created, you know, I think that just instantly um, put some fear into people. So in terms of market reaction, um, <clears throat> I think what, what we've got here is basically um, uh, we've got renewed faith in low interest rates for longer. That's why markets have suddenly bounced to the way they have. Not surprisingly, the dollar has sold off against pretty much all the majors and uh, you know, emerging market currencies. That's quite normal as a reaction, um, which means basically that the volatility that I and many others were expecting has probably been pushed back a bit. Um, it's now a Goldilocks scenario for a bit longer. So in terms of the numbers themselves, um, I think, um, I, th I think we've got to be careful here because when you look into it, the thing that I compare it to are the weekly jobless numbers that get published. Now, they're much more current. And if you look at those for the past two weeks in a row, we've had um, a significant improvement there. So I think what's happened with these numbers that, have, that were released today, it actually shows a month of two halves. I think you had a slow first half of April, um, which hasn't fully sort of uh, captured the very sharp pickup that we had in the second half of April. So when you average the two out, it comes across as being only 266,000. So I still have huge faith that going forward from here, you know, the numbers are going to be impressive. But I can understand that this comes as a surprise, but in my mind, it doesn't tally with the more current data that we've been seeing. Um, digging a little bit deeper, there are some rather alarming things here. So for instance, the number of firms that are reporting just how very difficult it is to hire staff. Now that's a combination of two things. One is um, the lack of uh, available skilled people, um, which by the way, has inflationary overtones to it. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, because of the, um, the, the stimulus program and the checks that have gone out and the support packages, three, four hundred dollars a week, 
um, not everyone is back into work. So in fact, this is now going to renew the argument that should we still be doing this? Um, because it's potentially a block. It's holding back the return to the workplace. You know, and we the similar argument has enraged over here with the furlough program. So um, I'm, I'm not alarmed by the numbers, even though I was initially very disappointed. Um, I think the best is indeed yet to come. Um, but that's that's what explains the, the reaction by the markets. It's risk on. Closer to home for you, Jabir, we know uh, the UK and France have never been shy of a, a neighbourly spat <laughs> over the course of history. Uh, this week's one sounds a little fishy. <laughs> yeah, it does. And um, it's a shambles, to be honest. I mean, you know, talk about hypocrisy and every other word one can come up with. So the background to this is that the, the French have suddenly, um, French fishermen specifically, let's be quite clear about this, uh, French fishermen who have always been fishing in the very rich seas just south of the Channel Islands um, are rather, uh, rather perturbed by the fact that their licenses to fish are not coming through quickly enough. I believe something like 40 to 50 licenses only have been you know, approved. Um, and what they're complaining about, and this is the irony of the whole thing, they're complaining about the bureaucracy <laughs> and, and the, um, the time, the length of time that it's been taking. Now we've been complaining about this basically since the start of the year, we've had our buildups. Remember just a little bit of context here, in the Brexit deal, um, the UK has granted uh, Europe a, still some sort of extension, to a grace period. Um, so Europe is eventually going to start to feel the same issues that we've been going through already because they did not allow us those same extensions. Okay, so specifically this war is around fishing. So the French decided, some 60 trawlermen, decided that they would go all the way to Jersey and block their port so that they could go and meet the council there and have a discussion. Um, so the UK in response sent a couple of naval frigates to duly uh, guard, guard the, the, the waters. After all, you know, Jersey is, a, is a, a British crown dependency. That's just the way it is. In the meantime, um, a French minister yesterday even suggested that they might, uh, they might shut off electricity to the island. I mean, this is farcical, absolutely farcical. I've, I've, never, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, anyway, look, they have now returned back to Normandy. Um, they stated their objections. I don't think they accomplished much. Um, and I think our two frigates are somewhere in the vicinity, you know, they're keeping their distance. Um, the French also, from a distance, sent two patrol vessels of their own. Now, you know, talk about inflaming the situation. Um, I don't think they really ever planned on using them. Um, their argument was that it was, it was just to sort of in case uh, the situation erupted. Um, but that's, that's where it was left. I, th I think it's a, it's a ridiculous situation. But what I do hope is that now the EU will wake up and actually say, look, how can we expedite this situation and just just smooth the wheels a little bit more. Um, both sides need it. Well, the big news for me personally, Jabir, for uh, the sake of my, my other life, was uh, the announcement of the British and Irish Lions squad to tour South Africa this week. And apparently there was some talk at the press conference that they were going to hold a, a training camp on Jersey. And Warren Gatlin was asked whether they would be allowed to go fishing. And he said, well, if so, not very deep. <laughs> but just some lighthearted banter there with the... Uh, Warren Gatlin, the Lions coach. Finally, and a, and a quick disclaimer that we are doing this late on a Friday afternoon, uh, this podcast, but early signs in UK local council elections uh, speak of good times for Boris Johnson and his Conservative Party. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, you know, it's, um, as you say, I mean, not all the results are in. In fact, it does take several days. So I think we'll only get a full, clear picture really by the weekend. So I mean, Saturday or Sunday. Evening. Um, but uh, several elections have been held. So, for instance, in the UK, we have our uh, council, our local council elections. Uh, there are many of them, hundreds of them. Um, actually, totals in excess, well in excess of a, a thousand. Um, 143 councils um, 
uh, in total, only 35 have been declared so far. So you can see there's a lot of counting still to be done, but a remarkable result by the Conservatives so far. I mean, they have gained 95 new additional councillors. Um, and most of that has come from, uh, in fact, all of it's come from the Labour Party. The Labour Party have had a shambles of a night. It's, it's a disaster, absolute disaster. Um, they have lost 116 councillors. So 95 of those have gone to the Conservatives or Tories as they're known as. But what I also find interesting is who else has gained. So the Lib Dems have gained eight. Um, that's usually a protest vote. I mean, that's, you know, that's the joke over here. The Greens have done well, they've gained 13. Well done to them. Reform UK, I've no idea who they are, but they've gained two. Um, UKIP, remember them, the UK Independence Party, they lost 11 as well. So I think that kind of, you know, I don't even know why they're still around, frankly. Um, but looking down the list here, the independents have gained four. But interestingly, the Residents Association have gained five. Now, you know, if you're looking for clues and trends, that tells you something. Because uh, residential matters are becoming more and more important. You know, if you're living in and around big cities, it's, it's a really, it's, 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 it's a big deal. You know, the costs, finding uh, rental accommodation, it's not easy and prices are soaring. So in a way, all of those other parties represent issues. Um, and I think frankly, putting it bluntly, the Labour Party has failed to address all of those issues. Mm. And that's reflected. The second election that took place was a by-election. So this was actually for our parliament. It's in a seat what used to be a famous Labour seat in Hartlepool, up in the northeast of the country. Um, and that went to the Conservatives last night. Uh, they took it with a majority of almost just shy of 7,000. It was a massive turnaround, you know, and that really has sent shockwaves through the Labour Party. Um, and then when you look at elsewhere, it, it really, it's, it's too early to tell at this stage. Um, in Scotland, for instance, for their, um, their parliament, remember this is a big deal for Nicola Sturgeon and her SNP, because she needs a majority here. Um, and with that, she will then really push for that second referendum. Um, so far, only a few results are in and uh, the Scottish nationalists have basically hang, hung on to, you know, what would they were expected to do. Um, so no, um, no major surprises. Oh, in fact, as I speak, one has just come through. Uh, the Labour Party has lost one, and that gain has gone to the Scottish Nationalists. So there's one result straight away. Literally, as I, I'm speaking, I'm just looking at this. Um, but it's a long way to go. Even amongst uh, those SNP gains or victories, I should say, um, they have lost some support in some, and they've gained some in a few others. So we, we don't have a trend at this point. Um, and the Welsh one is just still too early to call. So overall, I would say Boris and, and the Conservatives are delighted. They're looking very chuffed. Um, the reasons for the victory, I mean, I think, frankly, you know, look, we're still in the aftermath of Brexit. We've had a fantastic vaccination programme. Um, the reopening is underway. So there's a good mood factor in the country. You can see it. You can feel it here. You know, we're into the second phase of easing. Um, the third one is not far away, a couple of weeks away, and that really does mean that uh, more and more people can go back to their daily lives. So if you take all this together and a very weak opposition in Parliament, I mean, frankly, Sir Keir Starmer and, uh, and his uh, you know, band of people have simply not made any headway into the Conservative Party, and, they, and they've had a lot of failings. I mean, we, we were slow on the COVID side. We had the Dominic Cummings affair, if you recall, um, that was a shambles. Um, you know, we've, we've got this looming SNP Scottish referendum thing in the background. Um, then most recently, Boris and the refurbishment of his, uh, of his apartment. Um, they just simply have not made any headway. So they, I, I, I'm sure they're going to take a very serious look at themselves. Uh, there could even be some casualties here. Well, it's certainly one to keep an eye on, and perhaps uh, we've got our first topic for next week's pod when we uh, look at, uh, at the extended results and the implication for British politics. But, but for now, let's talk about UK unity. I mentioned uh, the British and Irish Lions 
tour earlier. What a wonderfully diverse squad. 11 Englishmen, 10 Welshmen, eight Scots, eight Irishmen. Uh, it's the best representation of the four home unions I think we've had uh, in recent years. So we're really looking forward to that uh, and uh, the, the build up to the tour. But as always, Jabs, great to catch up with you. Uh, hope the arm doesn't get too sore in the next couple of hours. Uh, this podcast, as always, available on Apple, uh, Spotify, the Google podcast platform for Android and all past podcasts available at Skybound Capital's website, www.skyboundcapital.com. Till next time on Under the Macroscope, have a great week.